in Second uh, Kings uh, chapter 4. It's quite difficult really sometimes to preach from chapters like this in the Old Testament because culturally they're so different. The situation is so different from ours. It's pre-Jesus Christ. It's Old Testament. Uh, the whole situation is very difficult from what our own experience and we look to apply and look to transfer it to ourselves and we certainly can do that. But it's not easy and it's not easy also because if you read this story, and it is a story, it's just uh, a real life story, it's only the bare bones of the story. So sometimes it's difficult, I think, for us to understand, or as we're reading it, I don't know if you were, as you were reading it, you were kind of going, oh, I'd like to know more about, what was going, where was the husband, what was happening? And there's all kinds of details that aren't given, and uh, so it can be difficult for us to, because we like to have so much information to, to make the most and understand these, these stories. But um, there are broad, I'm, I'm going to preach, and I have been preaching on Elisha with a broad strokes, um, but there's broad lessons that we can take from a story like this. Again, uh, not dissimilar to uh, the story we looked at last week about the widow's oil, how it's almost a kind of, um, it's a micro story within the bigger picture of what's happening in the Old Testament. And uh, it's, it's very similar to the ministry of Jesus. You know, they've got the ministry of Jesus. And, you know, he's coming with a great task. And he's coming to do something hugely significant. And he is, he is taken on flesh. He's become one of those human beings that he made. And there's this great task that Jesus has come to do. And yet the Gospels are full of micro stories, of individual accounts of Jesus dealing with people on the way even to the cross, on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to uh, being forsaken of the Father. And there's all these personal stories, individual stories of Jesus coming in and affecting Zacchaeus and affecting, obviously, uh, Lazarus and affecting other people who followed him and who listened to him and who were changed by him. And in many ways, that, this is a precursor of that. The same reality is that the gospel and God, uh, well, there's this great, uh, great story. There's also this, these individual instances where God is dealing with people. And unless we grasp that, we're going to struggle in our own Christian lives. If our own Christian life is simply a macro picture of what God has achieved for us on the cross, some kind of spiritual healing that will affect us in the future, then we're losing sight of the individual uh, touch of God and Jesus Christ who wants to transform and change our own lives daily and will use our experiences so to do. And there's really, in many ways, um, there's a very powerful message within this uh, and uh, I just want to cover a couple of things uh, and, and, and uh, apply it, uh, bring it around to remembering that we celebrate the Lord's Supper this evening. And I think in this woman's life, I'm going to call her Mrs. S, because we don't know her name. It's the Shunammite, the Shunammite woman. We'll call her Mrs. S because that seems convenient. For her opening her life to God was a dangerous thing. Okay, she opened her life to God and it was dangerous for her to do so. Obviously, I'm guarded in saying that because it was also amazing. But it was dangerous for her. It does seem there's a couple of hints in the passage that she was quite a private woman, that she didn't share her heart very openly, that she carried heavy burdens and a broken heart that she was not willing really to share with many people. And uh, 
But she opened her life to, to God through her contact with Elisha, the prophet of God, as it were, the representative of God. And um, that, that for her was a dangerous step. It was a good step. It was a dangerous step. And I do think we need to reclaim that truth. And I'm going to be looking at that a little bit through this story this evening, that when we open our lives to God, it is a dangerous thing to do. It's a good thing to do, but it's not, as it were, from a human point of view, the safe option for us. It's not the easy, casual, safe option that we're looking for in life. It's double-edged. Because very often when we allow God into our heart, to expo- His light to expose the darkness there and to redeem us, He's redeeming us from a place of danger. And it can be for us an earthquake if we will allow that to happen. If we don't close God off and keep Him at the front door of our hearts. Many of us will do that even as Christians. We feel that we can keep God at arm's length. That we don't need to let Him expose and change and renew and review us. But we can keep Him at arm's length. And we still feel that we will benefit from a relationship with Him. But Uh, we lose out so much. But he will challenge and play havoc with the human stability that you maybe feel you have, with your and my emotions and with our experiences. As we allow the great surgeon to begin to heal our hearts, rather than what we often do, is we want the great surgeon to heal our circumstances or other people's hearts. So for um, Mrs. S., it was a costly decision for her to allow Elisha into her life and God through Elisha. We believe clearly that she was, although it's implied, she was a woman of faith. And she knew about Elisha, and she knew the days that uh, we were, they were living in, and she knew he was a prophet of God, and that he, it was a blessing to know someone like Elisha. And so uh, he came every so often and stopped by, and she opened her home to him, and they had a meal together with uh, the family. But then she decided, let's make a small room on the roof, and a chair and a lamp, and he can, it can be like a granny flat for him. Anytime the prophet comes, or a grandpa flat, and a or prophet flat, uh, that case that he would come and he would stay there as he would open uh, she would open her home in this hospitable way and and who knows what her motive behind that was was it to uh, gain more insight into God was it to hear prophecy was it simply to obey uh, in in his uh, in Jewish tradition uh, to obey and to honor those who uh, were God's servants we don't know but for her it was a a costly uh, decision to be committed to Elisha and to his servant at this time. It was costly because she bore this burden of being childless. And um, that made her very vulnerable. And it made her, made her very fragile, um, particularly in uh, the society in which she lived. There was this longing for a child, this deep, deep desire to have family. And uh, with Elisha staying there, that longing could not be suppressed indefinitely. She tries to. It's interesting. She's been so kind, and Elisha says to her, you know, what is it we can do for you? There must be something we can do for you because you've been so kind. And uh, she says... um, It's a a very interesting reply. She says, I have a home among my own people. It's a guarded reply. She's saying, I'm okay. I've got a home and I'm with my people. But she's hiding the truth. She's hiding her her deepest longing. She's trying to suppress that. And um, Elisha uh, probes further, but probes through Gehazi. We don't know how Gehazi knows the family and knows what's going on, but he said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. So Elisha deals with this and prophesies by God and, and in God's strength and through the Spirit that she would have a child and would hold a son in her arms this time next year. 
Do you see her reply? Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. It's a great vulnerability and a great fear in this uh, answer. No, you know, don't tease me. Don't give me this answer because I've longed for a child for so long. Don't so simply just give this request. My heart is broken already. Uh, please don't mislead your servant. And so there's a great fear in her life that is revealing uh, this great need she has. And, and it's been ripped open by her contact with God uh, through the prophet. And then there's an amazing answer. Exactly as the prophet had said, by uh, one year later, she has the child. And, you know, uh, we read, there's only two verses there, but there's probably a good number of years in between. It's a very condensed version of the story because the child grew. One day he went out to his father who was with the reapers. We don't know what child. Was he a, a, a small, wouldn't have been a terribly small boy if he was, went out to the field uh, uh, with his father, but he complained of having uh, tremendously painful headaches and a terribly sore head. And he's carried into the mother and uh, she, he dies. He dies. How can you imagine that? We read that quickly and we, we pass over that. And maybe it's because we know the end of the story. The child lays on the couch. The, the child dies. Can you imagine the turmoil and the bitter distress of this woman. It's like, it's like doubly worse, isn't it? God gives her what she's longed for all these years and then takes, takes him away. What could be worse? What could be more cruel? What kind of God would do that? And uh, she cries in bitter distress. But isn't it amazing that she does go to Elisha? Again, she goes to Elizabeth, Elisha, and you notice again that uh, she doesn't say to her husband what's wrong. We don't know whether he knows by this point. It's not clear from the passage. Um, but she, she, she rides out to, to meet Elisha, and the husband asks why, and she says, it's, it's all right. And then Gehazi goes to meet her halfway, and she says, everything's all right. She doesn't want to do business with anyone, but with God's representative. Nobody else is involved at this point. And there's this tremendous pain in her experience. And she says, why? Yo, she's in bitter distress. Didn't I ask you for a son? Didn't I tell you? Don't raise my hopes. What could be more ordinary than that in the middle of the Bible? This is someone complaining to God that her hopes had been raised by his action in her life, and then they had been dashed. Many people will feel like that in their Christian lives, that their hopes have been raised, and then maybe their hopes dashed in desperate ways. And then we have the great uh, v visual story of, well, of Gehazi not being able to do effective, of any effective change, the servant, and I'm not going to go into that tonight, it might be that Gehazi didn't really have a genuine understanding and faith in God, though he was around the prophet and though he was the prophet's servant. And we will see that later in the next chapter indeed. But Elijah goes, Elisha goes, and uh, with this remarkable act, of lying on top of the boy, uh, there is restoration and healing and hope renewed. So we recognize that this woman's involvement with God was hugely costly to her comfort and to a life of ease, and yet God was working very powerfully in her because she also came to recognize through the struggle and through the sadness, and through the tears, and through the bitterness, a life of incomparable value. That God had touched her, that God had answered her prayer, that God had taken her through the darkness, and that God had restored what was lost to her. And there's darkness, there's shock, there's healing, there's blessing, 
and there's hope and there's a future for her through this visual uh, story of her losing, gaining, losing and gaining her child. Now, I'm sure much could be said about this and much could be made uh, in terms of spiritual parallels. But can I just interject here a little bit in terms of the story for ourselves? Because Elisha, I think clearly for us, is a prophet that points forward to Jesus. Many of the prophets do, and I mentioned this last time. Uh, But there's much here that points forward to Jesus. Elisha points forward to the restoration that God intends for his people. Ultimate, I believe, restoration. And often in this life also, restoration that is completed in glory. It's this ongoing picture of life out of impossibility, out of death, out of deadness. And we see it uh, with uh, Abraham and Isaac. Uh, When Abraham uh, offers up his son, we see it with Elijah, uh, with the widow of Zarephath, when he heals uh, and brings her child back to life. We see it in Job's experience when he loses everything and then uh, we find it restored. And then we see it pointing forward to Jairus' daughter, when Jesus goes and uh, in very similar terms to this, that Jesus goes in and closes the door and uh, brings life again to Jairus and Jairus' daughter. And it is all pointing to what Jesus has come to do on the cross. He has come to bring absolute disruption into people's lives, bringing from death life and all that goes with that. And there is a cost involved in that for us, a cost personally um, in allowing the great surgeon to open us up and to deal with our hearts. I think the problem for us so often is we want the salvation, but we don't genuinely want the healing. We don't want him to cut our hearts open and expose what are some of the bitternesses and jealousies and anger and uh, unforgiveness and all that lies deep within us. We want a cheap salvation and a cheap grace. We want healing and restoration. We want the child. We want the boy. But we don't necessarily recognize the great work of transformation that God needs to do in our hearts. We don't think we need to change very much. And we don't feel that what he is offering is a life of incomparable value. But there is that pointing forward to Jesus, and I, I, I hope this is not over-spiritualizing, but I think there is also, also a, a parallel between uh, Elijah having to come to the boy personally to deal with his death situation, and not only deal with him personally, but in that very intimate way, um, eyeball to eyeball, hand to hand, mouth to mouth, with him, speaks symbolically at least of what Jesus has come to do, that Jesus needed to come into our situation, that Jesus needed to identify himself with us even more than simply that intimacy of touch, but becoming one of us in order to die in our place. It goes further, in other words, than Elisha. It goes further than that situation, and uh, there's a reminder of the cost and the reality of uh, what Jesus has done for us in our lives. So I just want to, uh, in remembering that story, apply these things to ourselves in an ongoing way that the Christian life, as it was for the Shunammite Mrs. S., as it was for the Shunammite woman, which is very costly to allow God to act in her life, to even answer her prayers, I've said this before, the old fashion, the old, sorry, the old version of uh, Sam, which I can't remember which Sam it is, uh, by fearful works unto our prayers and answer dust express. So that the prayers that we make in and of themselves can be costly. You know, Lord, pray, I pray that I pray for holiness. Well, that's a costly prayer. And we don't know what pain and suffering may be uh, 
brought into our lives to bring us to that place where that prayer will be answered. And for her to involve herself in this man's life and uh, then for the request almost unwittingly to be made uh, was very costly for us. And so it will be and so it ought to be for us. I'm afraid of you closing and of me closing our lives to God, not being open to God. I'm afraid when our Christianity is pedestrian and nice and sweet because I'm afraid that we don't see and understand who he is, and I don't. When we invite God into our hearts uh, and invite him to be our Lord, that is a bomb under our lives because there's a cost to our choices and to our conscience to our selfishness. And there's also a cost to our fears because they will be exposed by God. And many of us will be carrying undealt with issues in our heart and lives, unrequited issues. And we will not allow God, his lordship, to deal with them. But he will push you over the edge because he wants you to fly spiritually. He will flick you out of the nest because he wants you to soar. He will let you be bruised all over because he wants you to walk. You know, we know that as parents, don't we? Our our children, when they're learning to walk, they bang against radiators and they, they hit their heads and they do all kinds of things. We can't cotton wool them. They need to learn to walk. We try and protect them course but these things happen as they learn to become strong and so it will be for us if we recognize that grace is is certainly free but it isn't cheap in our lives and this is this we are inviting the sovereign God into our lives who is not content that we simply paddle that we simply just tread water he wants us to uh, deepen in our relationship with him and Uh, have his uh, blessing and healing over our black and ugly sinful hearts. That's what he wants for us. It's not an easy option to become a Christian and to be a Christian and to live as a Christian. But it is, and this is the absolute corollary here, is that it's a life as it was for this woman It's a life of incomparable value. I think that the the anticipation of this story is a redeeming savior who comes, is one who comes to restore and to bring life. And that is all that the Old Testament points forward to, to blessing, to fruitfulness, to life, to renewal, and to relationship, fellowship with God forgiveness you know, so that we die and we stand before God and we're forgiven before him it is the declaration has been made we have hope and we have help and ultimately we have great restoration and that is an important and ongoing perspective in our lives as we consider him a life of incomparable value is what we need to, to consider and to remember. So as we head to the Lord's table, it's important that we, I do think in an ongoing way, recognize the cost of becoming a Christian. Um, I think it's in the society in which we live, it's, it's, it's an interesting mixture. Uh, there's a cost to being a Christian in the society we live in I'm not sure necessarily there's a cost in the church uh, because we're so afraid of losing people. We're so afraid of challenging people. We're so afraid of, of, of rebuking one another uh, and of, of pointing us and talking of Christ. I think sometimes the cost of being a Christian is more than how people react outside than what it involves in terms of commitment in the church. We do recognize the cost, but most of all recognize the cost in terms of honesty. 
that no one else can be honest with your heart before God. And it is important to be accountable and it's important to be open and it's important to lay a request before one another. But ultimately, what's your heart like before God and what's mine like? Are we honest with Him? Are we honest with our choices and with our heart and with the potential darkness that we choose to hold on to and can hold on to and not allow Him to deal with? And recognize the cost because it is a healing cost that until we recognize our need for healing, we simply will not be looking for this Savior. But in recognizing the cost, recognize too who He is, that He is the sovereign Lord. And there will be many times that He will deal with us in ways we don't understand, as it was in the story for the Shunammite woman. There's mystery to trusting in God. We don't have all the answers. We can't have it neatly packaged. It is, there is times of mystery and of crying out in bitterness uh, and with a bitter heart and bitter distress. And, and even those close to God might know the answer. Elisha didn't know. God had hidden it from him. He hasn't told them. And so, there's times when we will feel and sense that in our lives, but He's sovereign and He's good and He's holy and we will stand before Him. But it is that life not only of cost but of incomparable value, which I believe is why we are given the Lord's Supper. It's to remind us of that again, is it not? It's to remind us uh, that it is a healing pain. It is not it's not a deathly pain. It's a healing pain. There is a great difference between the two, however hard that is for us in our lives. And we remember that the hope we have is one of ultimate. It's hope in this life. It's life to the full now, but it's ultimate hope as well, which sometimes maybe they accused Christians in earlier centuries of thinking too much about that. Uh, but in the New Testament, a lot of the Christians were undergoing great and severe suffering, persecution. So it meant a great deal to them to know that the, this wasn't all there was. For us, well, we're pretty cushy. So it's quite a good life to have here. And maybe we don't appreciate heaven so much. But for those who are persecuted and struggling, then there is. But for all of us, there's this great knowledge of ultimate value and truth. My uncle Alan uh, passed away this week. Uh, he was 91 years old. And he had been a missionary for many years, a medical missionary with the leprosy mission in Hong Kong. And isn't it great? And it brings into perspective at times like this, the value of being a Christian. You know, that it matters and it is of incomparable value that he now knows incomparable joy. And may it be that uh, as we come to the table, we are not guilty of closing our hearts. You know, take the time just to examine your heart in the peace and quiet of the table. And uh, don't be content with powerlessness. Gehazi, well, we say a little more about him again, but Gehazi kind of is an interesting character hanging around this story but when he's sent out to to be the one to heal uh, the boy it, it doesn't work it's a bit like the disciples isn't it when, when they're asked to heal and they couldn't heal they, they didn't have the power they, Jesus said this comes out by prayer and fasting and he's kind of he's around the man of God and he's aware of what's going on but he's spiritually powerless and he's not recognized even, he's not recognized by the Shunammite woman as, as having weight or holiness or, or, or spirituality. And she doesn't confide in him. She doesn't think it's worth confiding in. May that not be what we're like, you know. Let's not be people whose hearts are closed that others will not confide in spiritually because they don't value what we have to say. Or that are powerless in our Christian lives. 
don't recognize and see and, and aren't, people don't come to us uh, f- for spiritual reality. It's an interesting challenge in, in the life of Gehazi and a thought for us. But maybe just for the few moments that we're together around the table that you just enjoy the peace and quiet and uh, uh, that you do that uh, as we must all do that work of examination in our own hearts and uh, recognize the cost and recognize the cost to Christ but also recognize the incomparable value of whose we are and uh, who we serve and if you're not a Christian this evening then how much more urgent is that that you will consider him and recognize there will be a cost for you particularly in your independence and in your freedom to choose what you're doing just now because you will become, like we were saying this morning, a follower, a learner, a disciple. And you'll say, not my will, but yours be done. And there's a cost to that, but it's incomparably great, the reality of what we receive from him in return. Amen. Lord, bless us as we turn to Uh, celebrate together in the peace and quiet and in the sense of just being a family together that we would uh, enjoy uh, sitting around the Lord's table in the way we do and uh, remembering your death and its great cost and applying that in our own lives and hearts and being refreshed uh, with the sacrament that you've given to us for Jesus sake we ask these things Amen